Greece. Is this the first scene, the first chapter of a few chapters we're going to see across Europe, and that's the opposition to the European Union? I think it is. It's a tipping point. Uh, I mean, it's been coming for a long time, right? We've been waiting for it because there's been so much dissatisfaction um, on the streets uh, across the periphery in France and even some of the core states uh, with what has been crippling austerity and what has been. I mean, look, we talked, 2014 was the land of Piketty, uh, not in the United States. I mean, we bought it. We didn't read it, but we bought it. It. But in Europe, you actually lived it, right? I mean, that's why this guy became as well known as he did. And it's precisely because you have such crippling youth unemployment. You have everyone under 30 thinking they have no, no choice, no chance in these countries. And in Greece, the people came out, the birthplace of democracy, and they decided to vote in an astonishing factor for a party that would have been considered completely beyond the pales of Greek democracy and Greek party politics even a few years ago. Ian, we sit here, we talk about anti-European sentiment, and often we talk about the economics and we talk about the markets. You speak to businesses every day about political risk. How concerned are they about the rise of anti-European sentiment? I think they're concerned about Europe. It's not just about the rise of anti-European sentiment. It's about um, you know, radical Islam in the region. It's about uh, lack of uh, willingness of the Germans to lead in collaboration or cooperation with anyone else. It's about the Brits being completely at the margins of this debate, uh, which is a misfortune for everyone. Uh, it's about France also not leading with Germany. And it's about every geopolitical issue in the world that affects the Europeans so much worse than it affects the United States or the Chinese or Japan. So Europe really, I mean, if you're talking to CEOs right now, Fortune 100 CEOs, yeah. uh, it is volatility in oil prices and concerns about Europe that's absolutely leading the charge. Greece and Greek politics, an example of what is going out on elsewhere in Europe. When you look at Tsipras, the big question yesterday whether this guy was the new Chavez, whether he was the more business-friendly, socialist side of things. Where does he sit on the spectrum, Ian? Um, I think there's a question. He certainly is going to be much more moderate as an individual um, now that he's governing. Um, and you've seen that very clearly with his, we, you know, leaving NATO was, I know I've said it, but it's not on the agenda right now. And we still want to be a part of the euro and we want to negotiate. We're not going to default. But, you know, it's very, it's one thing for him to say that. It's another for all of his ministers, for his new minister of finance to have the same sort of temperance when none of these people have been in governance before. They're in coalition with the independent Greeks who haven't been in government before. Um, and they've got some hefty promises that they need to make good on. And when you see the reaction from people like Merkel and her government, from Christine Lagarde and the IMF and others, you realize that the, that the chasm between where Syriza is have, and no one was congratulating Syriza on their win except for Putin basically yesterday, right? So, I mean, they, they lost. Merkel caught up this morning about 20 minutes ago. I, did, I didn't see that. And what did she say? She said, Congratulations. Well, good for yeah, her. She has a great responsibility. That's just like Obama deciding to send, uh, you know, sort of carry over to France like a week late, right? I mean, you know, the sentiment shows when you don't get it done immediately. And that's the point, right? I mean, it's not better late than never. It's actually sometimes better never than late. Absolutely.